second. Let's make sure we got good audio. All right, there we go. How about now? Oh, much better. Thank you. I forgot to I'm turn my like, man, I knew my hearing was bad, but <laughs> I forgot to turn my microphone on. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so Ken, I'm assuming you're not starting the meeting at all. That's correct, ma'am. He's on the road. Okay. All right. Well, it's after nine, so I guess we'll get the show on the road. Um, I'd like to call to order the Lyon County Board of County Commissioners. This is Wednesday, April 13th, 2022, just after 9 a.m. Agenda. Action will be taken on all items unless otherwise noted. No action will be taken on any item until it's properly agendized. To avoid meeting disruptions, please place cell phones and beepers in a silent mode or turn them off during the meeting. The board reserves the right to take items in a different order to accomplish business in the most efficient manner. Items may be combined for consideration and items may be pulled or removed from the agenda at any time. Restrictions on comments by the general public. Any such restrictions must be reasonable and may restrict the time, place, and manner of the comments, but may not restrict comments based upon viewpoint. Board of Commissioners convening it as other boards. Members of the Board of County Commissioners also serve as the Liquor Board, Sensor Lion Vector Control District Board, Mason Valley Mosquito Abatement District Board, Walker River Weed Control District Board, Willow Creek General Improvement District Board, the Silver Springs General Improvement District Board, and during this meeting may convene as any of those boards as indicated on this or a separately posted agenda. Please take note that this meeting may break between 11.30 and 1.30 for lunch. Roll call, we've got Ken Gray on Zoom on the road. And it looks like I have Commissioner Hockaday, Commissioner Henderson, and Commissioner Jacobson running for his seat in Chambers. At this time, I'd um, like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Jeff, if you could please lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. At this time, we will uh, entertain public participation. No action will be taken on any item until it's properly agendized. It is anticipated that public participation will be held at this time, though it may be returned to at any time during the agenda. Citizens wishing to speak during public participation are asked to state their name for the record and will be limited to three minutes. The board will conduct public comment after discussion of each agenda action item, but before the board takes any action. Afterwards, please print your name for the clerk's desk, or if you're on Zoom, please spell your name. So do I have anybody for public comment at this time for something that's not on the agenda? Nobody in chambers, ma'am. Okay, and I'm not seeing anybody on Zoom either, correct? Correct. Okay. For possible action, review and adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion, please? Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the and adopt the agenda. All in, uh, excuse me, public comment. <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. Okay, that brings us to item five for the comptroller, 5A for possible action. Approved tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Mr. Foley. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to make a statement before we start, if I may. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't on the agenda, okay? <laughs> I, I, I understand. But I, I feel this, this statement has to be made. Um, NRS 281A.420 requires me to disclose a conflict of interest. A very small portion of the tentative budget before this body may affect my commitment in a private capacity to the interest of my wife. She is employed by the medical provider that is the contractor for medical services at the jail. Her job is not dependent on, on approval of this budget and her employment is not impacted one way or the other with the approval of the tentative budget. Therefore, I conclude that the independence of judge, judgment of a reasonable person in my situation would not be materially affected by this relationship. And because this is not a clear case of a disqualifying conflict of interest, 
I will be participating in this hearing and I'm going to be voting on the tenant of budget. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Henderson. Um, just real quickly before moving on, was there anybody else? Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Foley, you're up. Thank you, good morning, Madam Chair and uh, Board of Commissioners. I would like to uh, offer the board an option at this time, option A or option B. Option A is a shorter option, which is I can do a high level overview and go through significant items in the budget and then answer any additional questions the board may have. And option B would be to go page by page as we've traditionally done in the past. So I am open to either approach. I think uh, with this particular budget, we could easily do option A and, and be able to cover it and save some time for yourselves. Up to you though. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Foley. I. I like the summary view and then uh, if somebody has specific questions we can pull that and, and discuss it um, what would the board like to entertain no uh, madam vice chair I, i'm good with option a okay. commissioner madam Jenkins. vice chair i'm uh sorry to cut in front of you mr hockaday no that's fine all uh, right you probably up late with the water meeting monday night anyhow I, uh, I'm fine with option A. I do have just a couple questions as I went through it, but um, I think option A works for me. Mr. Hockaday, what's your flavor? I totally agree. Option A works for me. Okay, well, Mr. Foley, let's go with option A and if we have specifics, we could address them individually. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm just gonna do a, uh, a quick synopsis of changes from prior year to, to current year significant changes and approaches to the budget. The first one is, is that we changed the tax rate uh, in the general fund. We decreased it by 4.3 cents in the recommended budget and moved that to the silver and gold fund, which is for our senior services. We also decreased the tax rate in the medical indigent fund to the minimum required by statute and moved an additional 1.7 cents from the medical indigent fund into the silver and gold fund. And that replaced the utility license fees that we had previously allocated in silver and gold fund. So $800,000 in utility license fees in the silver and gold fund were then put back into the general fund where they used to be. And then the general fund actually decreased $200,000 of those and moved those into the road fund to provide funding. And I'll, I'll cover the reasons why in a little bit. Uh, just so everyone is aware what utility license fees are, when you pay your gas bill or your electric bill, if you happen to be in an unincorporated area of the county, there's a, a 5% rate that's levied on for the county on that bill, and it comes to the county to provide governmental services. And so that's what those funds are. And we're putting all of those in the general fund with the exception of what goes into the road fund. What this allows us to do in the silver and gold fund is eliminate the, um, the human services director from coming every year and saying, I need more money, I need more money. Her revenues will actually grow uh, as the tax rate grows, just like it does in every other fund. And so she's able to have a sustainable source of revenue by doing a tax rate from year to year. And so that was the, the major impetus for doing this. I would love to do the same with the road fund, but there are a number of reasons why that's not practical at this point. And so we put utility license fees into that to make up the difference between what its operations are and what the um, gas taxes provide in that fund because those provide the lion's share of the funding there. <clears throat> the other changes, we did increase the salary table to salaries across the board for all appointed officials by 4% pursuant to the contracts that we have with our associations. We also have a 2.5% merit upon their anniversary date built into the contract as well. The justice of the pieces, they are elected. We did do a 4% salary increase recommendation for them. And the rationale behind that was that we're going to 48 hour bail hearings, which effectively means there's a strong potential for a seven day a week work week for those people. We're hopeful to alternate some of that so that it's, they don't have to work every day of the week, every week, every week of the year. And so, but it still is a significant 
time commitment for, commitment for them. So we did increase the salaries. We increased some of the salaries on the legal side too, and I'll discuss those when we get to those budgets. But that's that's a high level overview of of just the the changes in methodology in the budget as we went forward. So let's um, we'll go into the revenues, but before we get to those pages, let me just give you a high level overview as well of our economy. You're hearing it in the news, but I'm going to try and take what's happening in the news and bring it down to what's going to happen at Lyon County's level. I gave a similar presentation to the board in 2008. So this is kind of remembrance of the past for some of us. So in other words, you're the Grim Reaper? <clears throat> I'm the Grim Reaper. We're not there yet. Uh, it took until 2011 for us to really bottom out on that, but it started the trend. So what we're looking at in the economy right now is we're looking at, in many places, double digit inflation which is significant. We didn't even have that back in 2008. In fact, we were closer to deflation than we were inflation back then. But we're looking at uh, inflation, significant inflation, which makes for our budget, the contingency significantly more important this coming year than it has been in prior years. Because if costs for us to purchase supplies and fuel and all of those things continue to increase as we go forward, which traditionally they will, then we have to use that contingency because we build the budget on a methodology of tell us what you need based on today's prices. Don't try and build in contingency in every line item across the board. That's why we have a contingency. And so they're building in what it costs today for the most part. Fuel might be a small exception. We did increase that slightly. Um, in addition to that, gas prices are going up. What we normally see when gas prices go up additional inflation on our purchasing power. It also impacts significantly departments like the Sheriff's Department and the Road Department as far as their fuel prices. In addition to, and the oil prices for the Road Department for doing almost any road work. And the gas price revenue in the Road Fund and the RTC Fund traditionally decreases as we do that. Now we didn't project for a decrease. I used the state's projections for those revenues, knowing that we're more than likely not going to, to get that unless the ship turns really quickly the other direction. Um, so what does all of those mean to us? Consolidated taxes probably are not gonna come in where projected. They usually, when inflation is happening, gas prices are going up. The consolidated tax sales portion go down because people are spending money on essentials and not spending as much on the other items and so we don't give as much revenue there. In addition to that, uh, building permits traditionally drop in an environment like that because with interest rates going up, that decreases the price of homes and decreases the amount of new construction, which also in turn decreases building permit and consolidated taxes. And then of course the gas tax is already talked about. So high level overview of that again, we're probably not going to get the revenues that we budgeted for. But we budgeted conservatively, so I think we'll be all right and we'll just go throughout the year and watch the contingency as we go. Uh, we also have one other major expense that's coming down the pike towards us, which is a capital case, capital murder case. The last time we had one of those, it cost us in excess of a million dollars at the county level. I wouldn't be surprised with inflation and everything since then that we're looking at potentially $2 million our dollars out of our pocket for that. Now, we are hopeful that the Department of Indigent Defense will fund a significant portion of that, if not all of that for us through the state legislature. But depending on what happens at the state level, the next legislature, because this trial is gonna go for many years by the time it goes all the way through discovery and all the way through um, the initial trial and appeals process and all of that, it seems like it takes anywhere from four to five years to go all the way through that process. So it's not like it's gonna happen right away. So the legislature could say, hey, we're only gonna allocate X dollar amounts in any given year to reimburse the counties for this. So it's possible we're gonna be putting some of that bill um, as we go forward. So I just wanna put that out there. Right now, we're not, not anticipating it, but it's something to keep our, keep our mind around and, and keep, keep in the back of our mind at least. 
So let's move on to revenues. So you first have in your, your budget of revenue projections, we'll go to page one. And these are just general fund revenue comparisons. We can take a look at the ad valorem tax. And for the upcoming year, we're projecting the general fund. It's gonna go up 3.64%. Part of that is because we're decreasing the tax rate there, moving some of the tax rate into the silver and gold fund. Consolidated tax revenue, very similar increase to the prior year, estimated 9.93%. Again, not anticipating it's gonna stay at that amount with the economy the way it is. That very well could not even make it up to that level, but we'll keep an eye on that as we go. Let's move on to the next page, which would be page two. That's just a graph of tax rates that the county has showing that for the past 10 years, the tax rate in total for the county hasn't changed. We've moved it around between funds at times, depending on where the need was, as we're doing this year, um, allocating six cents to the silver and gold, decreasing the tax rate in the general fund and the medical indigent fund. But the total tax rate for the county is staying the same. If we go to page three, that just shows the tax rate over the past uh, handful of years in the general fund. So you can see it's actually decreasing again because we're moving that tax rate. We'll move on to page four. You can see the general fund revenue and I, I took the general fund revenue and excluded the grants. So you can see what our base operating budget is from year to year without looking at that. And we're projected to increase in total 7.3%. Then we can move on to page five, which is what our assessed valuation did for the year. The top part of that page shows actual assessed valuation. The bottom part of that page is a graph of the percentage change in assessed valuation. So we're actually increasing 14.35%. Revenues do not go up by that amount because there is a tax cap in place on your primary residence, it can only go up 3%. If it's a non-primary residence, um, general rule is it can only go up, up to 8%. This year we are at those caps, 3%, 8%. Some years it was actually 0.1%. And so um, we are, are doing that. And if the sales tax revenue goes down, we can usually count on this to keep us afloat for a little while, but it's only about, um, 25 to 30% of your revenues. So just keep that in mind. So let's move in the general fund. Let's move on to the next page, page six. This is the tax revenue for property taxes. And you can see the top again is the total property tax revenue. The bottom is the change. We're anticipated to go up 9.8%. Now the question may come up, why is it 9.8% when we're capped at 8%, 3%? Well, new growth comes in at full value. And so all of the new houses that were built in the past year, all of the new equipment that was put in at Nevada Copper, which is hundreds of millions of dollars, all came onto the roll. And so we are seeing a higher amount than the tax cap because of the new amounts coming in. We'll move on to page seven. Now we're looking at just the general fund property tax revenue. Keep in mind, this is somewhere between 25 and 30% of the general fund revenue. Percentage change, we're looking at 3.6% increase. We'll move on to the next page, page eight. This is our consolidated tax revenue. Again, current year and next year are projections because right now I only have revenue through January and consolidated tax. So I still have another five months worth of revenue that we're just gonna have to see what happens with inflation and everything else. May not come in as high as projected, but we're looking at 9.9% increase. This is almost 50% of our general fund revenue coming in right here. So this is what's helping us to add new positions in the recommended budget this next year is because we have this going up much higher than the 4% salary increases that we're, we're looking at. Let's move on to page nine. If we combine consolidated property tax revenue and general fund together, this shows you your dollar amount. And so it's seven and a half percent increase um, for this upcoming year. So we've had a, a handful of good years. The past three years have been really good to the county, which is why we have added positions over the past three years. Prior to that, it was few and far between that we added significant amounts of positions. This year, we we're able to add a lot more because of that dynamic. 
going forward with the uh, economy going the way it is, we may see more challenges with that as we go forward. So those are the revenues. Do we have any questions before I move on to capital? Output? Hearing none, we'll move on forward to the next tab, capital outlay on page 10. This is a synopsis of all the governmental requests for capital outlay for this upcoming fiscal year. It does not include the utilities. We will go and take care of those individually. It also shows the recommended funding, which fund that these will come out, will be paid out of, I should say. So let me walk through them one by one. Some of them I can gloss over, some of them I want to spend a little more time on. The first request is for a new camera and microphone system for the commissioner chambers. It's $66,478. I put it in here. There was a request or discussion about, about the board. It wasn't actually a formal request, but I put it in. It is recommended in the budget, but I want to bring it up so the board understands what it is. If you decide you want to spend money on that or not, we, the recommended budget is just that. We're recommending you come in and tell us what tweaks that you prefer because this is the lion's share of uh, the most important thing that this board does mm -hmm. in an annual basis is oversee the budget for the, for the county. So what $66,478 gets you is a portion of what you saw in the city of Fernley when you went to the council chambers. Their system actually was $200,000, significantly more intricate than ours. Is. Our recommendation would be if the board chooses to adopt it. And what it would do in these chambers would provide three cameras that would have the capability to zoom in on whichever microphone is speaking. There would be a delay of three seconds from the time someone starts speaking until it zooms in on that person. So what you would get is you would have a camera similar to what you have today that shows the entire board. And then when someone starts speaking, three seconds after that, it will zoom in on whatever commissioner or public comment or someone as myself sitting here is talking, zoom in on their face. So you would have that capability to see in Zoom. It also would change the microphones just for the Board of County Commissioners up there to include a, a little button that you would push and it would change the color from red to green. There would be a display panel in front of the chair that would light up saying a commissioner wants to speak. So then the board chair knows I have someone who wants to speak or multiple people. The person speaks, push their button at when they're speaking and it takes the light off of the commissioners. Besides that, it functions exactly the same as everything that we have right now. And that would be what the 66,478 would purchase if the board chooses that that's something that they want to do. So any questions on that before I move forward? Uh, Mr. Foley. Yes. Uh, as we go hit on certain items like that, do you want to get the flavor of the board now or at the end? You know, it's your preference. It, it may be faster if we get it now, but we can definitely go through and do it at the end. It's up to you. I just know in, in the past, you know, I've done a few budgets. If we hold everything to the end, people lose track of their thoughts uh, on an item. And so I would prefer that we kind of address certain ones as we go. Um, and so with that being said, I have a hard time knowing that with the inflation and uh, <clears throat> everything, the, I felt like when you were speaking in the beginning, deja vu, been here, done this. So uh, I have a hard time spending $66,478, I think is what the total is. Uh, just so that a camera can zoom in on somebody that's speaking. As far as the microphones having a red or green, we've only got five board members. Uh, I don't feel that we've had an issue with ignoring any one commissioner, whether or not they wanted to speak. So I have issues with uh, allowing this, but I will allow the other commissioners uh, Commissioner Gray has his hand up. Let's address him first, and I'll come back to the board. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I am all for technology, but this is crazy, especially when there was so much heartburn and consternation just about getting, you know, I, what I, you know, what I feel is a uh, a very important thing, uh, you know, getting Wi-Fi down to uh, Smith Valley. There's no way we can justify this uh, to the taxpayers. This is wrong. 
Okay, uh, commissioners and chambers. Uh, I'll just start at sure. one side to the other. I'm sorry, who was that? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Madam oh. Vice Chair. This is uh, Commissioner Jacobson. I agree, I'd rather move this $66,000 to probably the contingency fund would be my uh, recommendation if we can do that. But uh, but nobody needs to zoom in on me for sure. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Henderson or Commissioner Hockaday, any comments? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'm actually the one that brought this up. You know, um, I am really happy with the Zoom participation that we have gotten for our meetings. However, if you look, and especially you right now, uh, Vice Chair, you know, when you look at all you see basically is the back of Josh's head and a, and a dais with people that you can't even identify. I, so I was looking at this to enhance the, uh, ex the Zoom experience for our constituents. However, it's not something that I am married to in any way. If we'd rather uh, keep it the way it is so that it's really hard to see online, that's fine too. Commissioner Hockaday. Well, I'm always uh, afraid to spend money when we have a system that is working. So uh, I agree, move it to contingency or wherever else we have uh, an essential need. Okay, Mr. Foley, do you need that in a form of a motion or do you get to take the consensus to the end? What I will do with your permission is I will make a list of all the changes that the board uh, addresses as we go forward. And when we get to the end, I will uh, outline those so that it can be in the form of a motion for the board. Thank you very much. Okay. And if I'm not speaking right now, it's because I'm trying to write at the same time. And so give me just a second. What, you can't walk <laughs> and chew gum? <laughs> Take your time, Mr. Foley. If you need a note taker, uh, Mr. Henderson will volunteer. <laughs> okay, I will move forward. Uh, that was good, Rob. That was good. <laughs> okay, so moving down, we do have replacement vehicles. I'm just going to mention them uh, as we pass through each one and just let you know the methodology we use when we uh, decide whether to do a replacement vehicle or not. Traditionally, what happens is the road department goes through and evaluates the mileage and the condition and the maintenance costs on each vehicle each year, and also discusses with the department heads on how those vehicles are functioning for them. And they will come and make a recommendation on which vehicles need to be replaced uh, or new vehicles purchased. And so that's a methodology that we use. Traditionally, unless we're getting a vehicle that's really causing problems, you're looking right around 200,000 miles for everything outside of the sheriff's office. And we use a general rule of thumb of around 150,000 miles on sheriff's vehicles because that doesn't reflect the true hours on the engine because they keep the car running to keep the batteries uh, charged so that they can use their laptops and their radio system at all times. And so it may have 200,000 miles worth of usage on it, but part of that is idle usage, so. Um, Madam Vice Chair, uh, Commissioner Jacobson, I was just curious, um, on replacement vehicles with the cost of used vehicles now, do we, when we sell those, does that come back and offset some of these? So we will bring those in and we just show that as a revenue and whichever fund the vehicle is purchased out of. So if the road fund sells a vehicle, that's for each end of its useful life for us. We will sell it, but that revenue is revenue into that fund. Thank you, sir. Also, um, the board should be aware that there are many instances where the shop will keep a number of vehicles for parts. A recent example is um, we had a, a vehicle that had, a, I can't remember what the mechanical problem was. Um, we had a crashed vehicle that didn't do anything wrong with the engine. The mechanic pulled the engine out of that vehicle, put it in the other vehicle, and we're, we're ready to go. So we do keep the vehicles also for um, parts as necessary. Okay. And we'll move on. Facilities is requested that we replace the HVAC units on the building that we're in right now. Well, many of us are in right now, the administrative complex. And instead of doing them, one recommendation was we could do it half one year, half another year but you have to pay for a crane to come on site. And so we'd rather do them all in one year. And we're well over 20 years on these units so we can get more efficient units and ones where they're 
not on a regular basis on the roof trying to get them to function properly. Um, so that's the 140,000 for that. We have 51,000 for the Silver City Community Center and 30,000 for the Dayton Community Center for to convert them from swamp coolers to HVAC systems. What we find many times, especially when you have areas that you have elderly people in, is those swamp coolers do not drop the temperature below uh, probably 85, 90 degrees in the summertime. Many times we we have a need for people to be using those buildings and have those be a little more climate controlled for the people who are there. So that's the thought process there. Plus swamp coolers waste water. True. Thank you. What was that? I said swamp coolers waste water. <laughs> yep. So then uh, we'll move on to a replacement vehicle, a truck for our facilities, and then a replacement vehicle for the public guardian. That one's reached the end of its life. Walker River Justice Court bailiff vehicle. They've been asking for years for this one to be replaced. We told them the reason why it doesn't shift smoothly when you start it up is because you weren't driving it on a regular basis. But with the evictions over the past year, they've been putting a lot more miles on this, going to Silver Springs and, and around this area of the county, the south area of the county. Uh, for the sheriff's office, we have nine vehicles being replaced. Um, part of those are being funded out of the vehicle acquisition fund and part out of the general fund. We would love to perform a lot of vehicle acquisition fund, which is paid for by brothel fees. We used to give $384,000 a year into that before the, um, before the pandemic. Now we're bringing in around 165,000-ish each year. Um, so we're funding, we save up so we have enough cash there. So when we order it, we have the cash to do it. So we've gotten to the point that we have a year's worth. And so we're paying for three vehicles in the recommended budget out of the vehicle acquisition fund. Then we'll move down to the uh, Parks and Rec, they had requested a metal building in Dayton to be able to have a, um, a spot for staff and a lot of their equipment to keep it in one location at the South Plant. We didn't include that in the recommended budget. The reason why, I would love to fund this one, by the way. The reason why is we have two large capital projects that we're trying to get accomplished right now that are further down on the list. One of those is to replace the Dayton Justice Court and some of the other offices in Dayton. We're looking at an approximate cost right now, not including improvements to Dayton Valley Road and Minor Road of approximately $23 million for that. We have the public safety complex to change the, the Sheldon space to become usable space upstairs and remodel the district court space. And that's estimated to come in around $10 million at this point. So just to give you an idea where we're at, we're probably two to three years out from having the cash to do the upstairs at the district court. We're also probably four to five years out from having the cash, throwing everything that we can at this to be able to get this building done on the Dayton government call. So with that being said, let me move back up and say that is the primary reason why we're not recommending doing something uh, like this. And we're not talking an extravagant metal building. We went out and asked at the Justice Complex to do a water softener to add on a 12 by 12 metal shed that one side was already built because it's part of the building and just add on a, a lean-to really on the side of the building metal. 12 by 12 was $120,000. <coughs> is what the estimate came back on. And so the $500,000 doesn't get you a Taj Mahal. It doesn't give you a, a significantly large building, um, but we're trying to save up money for those two projects. And that's why it's not the recommended budget. Again, the board can, can tweak this as we go, but that was the thought process. I see a question. Yeah. Um, we're talking just a straight metal building. I'm saying a 12 by 12 straight metal building, yes, like what we bought for a couple hundred bucks years and years ago. And yet a place like say out West building sells a 10 by 20 wooden structure 
for ten thousand dollars. I'm just wondering how we are being taken by getting a metal building. Are they substantially better than, say, a wood construction building, and we can't use them? I'm not sure. So I would leave that facilities. I think these. This this is Doug, facilities director. Um, what the deal was is there's not any room at the Justice Center for this. Uh, building so it has to be engineered because we have to run the sprinkler system into it tie the smoke detectors all that into this thing so they came up with an estimate of about $120,000 right now we have a proposal to probably get it done I just sent it to Josh not too long ago and it was we're going to put it in a supply room that but we have to run three inch pipe for 70 feet back and forth so it's copper pipe of course is pretty expensive but it's going to be more economical to do it that way. So I'm in favor of not, uh, you know, not doing that project this year, but we'll do the water softener in a different different room. Uh, Commissioner Gray, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I have a very hard time supporting this also. The purpose of this is going to be solely to support equipment, Josh. Is this correct? Mr. To house equipment. Since we have Mr. Homestead on the on the line, Doug, can you talk about the metal building and Dayton you're requesting for parks? Yeah, right now um, we use the the um, utilities and uh, road department lot, which is way down. Um, uh, can't think of the road now, right now, off the top of my head, way out there. What's what's it, uh, Josh? At the end of Lakes Boulevard. Yeah, Lakes Boulevard. Yeah, like, yeah. So they have a they have quite a bit of travel distance every day to go get pick up the equipment and all that. So we thought it'd be easier if we could maybe use those lots up next to the courthouse that we own, the uh, next to the Bluestone building, and put it's something tagging closer. On, tagging on to what uh, uh, Commissioner Hockaday said, why don't we just build a you know a twelve by twelve shed or a uh, or have a twelve by twelve shed wooden shed or larger built at one of the parks say i mean even in river park there's room that could be made to put uh not at river park but at a uh, patriot park where you could put a storage facility that you know there's going to be eyes on frequently it can be alarmed i mean and it's more centrally located but a hundred and twenty thousand dollars that is just so that's gut wrenching we're, we're talking about two different buildings here yeah, if I could, Madam Chair, this is a $500,000 metal building in parks. I was just giving an example of what a 12 by 12 building in, at the Justice Complex would have been, which were, is not included in the budget. Just okay. So yeah, the, the, the metal building here is like a 40 by 40 um, building. And the okay. reason- And it's not, go ahead, Josh. Another reason we didn't consider this is because that, the proposed location was in a historic district and we can't just put up a metal building in the historic district. So good catch. Number of issues there. So it's not in the recommended budget. Again, if the board wants to have further discussion on this and we can do that, I'll move on uh, unless the board wants further discussion on this one. Any other comments? Okay. So then we move on to the Dayton Valley Event Center well engineering. And this is a little more inclusive than just engineering. So this is a request to replace the well pump, to do research on water rights, which we do not own on that well. It is owned by a 4-H club that has not been in existence for probably decades. And we don't even know if we can get the water rights figured out. And so with that being said, I didn't feel like it was reasonable to ask the board to put this in the budget at this point, um, just because of those issues. We don't own the property it's on. There are a number of challenges with this particular project. And so even though it's requested and we would definitely love to have a facility that has its own pump water up there instead of having to uh, tell people to bring their own water, take Santa hats up there and those type of things. That was the thought process on this particular one. Yeah, just, just a comment, if I may. I'm, I, I agree with not funding this. I'm, I'm not in favor of spending any money on Dayton Valley Event Center until we own it. And Madam Chair, if you would like me to move on or if you want further discussion, let me know. 
Uh, any other discussion on that item from anyone? Okay. Okay. Not hearing any, Josh, go ahead. Thank you. So we'll move on to the uh, parks and rec. We, the next line item is a replacement vehicle for the parks. And then we'll move on to park construction tax. And what we do is we take the amount that we think we're gonna have sitting in the fund at June 30th, plus all the revenues for next year. And we budget all of it that way it allows the board Park Tax Board and this board to approve large projects that may be still in the works and we just don't know at this time what those are going to entail. And so we just budget all of it. We may not spend it. The cash stays there. If you don't spend it, we budget similarly in ensuing years. Then we'll move on to facil court facility assessments, approximately $720,000 there. And that is a fee that the or a fine that the justice courts levy on the cases that come to them certain cases by state law and it has to be used for port facilities it's under the control of the board of county commissioners but the board cannot deny a reasonable request a significant portion of this can be used towards funding the new government complex in dayton uh, for that court we have done that when we originally built the firmly justice court we did that when we built the Walker River Justice Court. And so Dayton is ready for their turn. So they, they've had those discussions um, on that already. We'll move down to the roads. Hey, Mr. Foley, I have a question. Yes. D just clarification. Um, like on the court facility assessments, the park construction tax. So when, when we say total request, we have the total amount there. Um, if I heard you correctly, and I just wanted to clarify, that doesn't mean that we've allocated all of that money. It just means that we're requesting it for that fund. That is correct. Okay. That, that allows you to spend it throughout the year as projects come up without having to have them completely fleshed out by this point to the budget year, year and a half before it could all be spent. Or without having to do an augmentation. Or without having to do an augmentation. Well, and technically you cannot do an augmentation unless you have unexpected revenues. So if, we, let's just say we budgeted for $500,000 for projects and park construction tax, and we're putting in lights at a baseball field or scoreboards or whatever the case may be. And with inflation, it came out to $600,000. Well, I'm sorry, now you have to wait under state law until the next year so we can build it the budget the next year. <laughs> okay. It, so, anyways, thank you, Mr. Foley. I, I, like I said, I wanted it as a clarification um because we always get those phone calls after the meeting going well you spent all this money and that money no that's not what we did so thank you and the same holds true on the rtc fund as well we use that same philosophy with that money so that we can go through those projects and we we don't have to stop a project midstream because we were off by two thousand dollars on the budget or 10 or 50 or whatever it is uh, let's move on down then to roads, 165,000 or 145,000 for replacement vehicles. We'll move down to human slash senior services. And this is $37,322. And this is actually just grant match. Shayla has done a phenomenal job over the years of getting NDOT and other grant sources to fund. So this is a small piece of what two ADA compliant minivans would be for their transportation program. In reading the budget, it seemed like it was a 50% match. So she got basically these vehicles for half price. Is that correct? These ones are actually significantly more expensive than that, I think. And so I think we're, we're paying, I'd have to go look at what the vehicles were. It seems like the vehicles are around 60, 65,000 pieces. We're paying about 15 to 18,000. That, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Great job to Shayla and her crew. Yep. We are lucky to have the people we have, I would say that over and over again. So then we'll move on to the Mason Valley Mosquito District. They've requested a replacement truck. They haven't had a new one in many years. Um, they put a number of miles on that. And then we'll move on to some of the requests uh, in the Capital Improvement Fund. And we have $2.3 million there that I recommend we don't allocate until we get it. And that would be money that by congressional act we get. And if they don't do a congressional act, we don't get. So some years we have not received it in the fiscal year that we thought we were going to. So in this particular case, this is $2.3 million that we are budging to receive in June of 
three at the end of the fiscal year. So I'm like, don't spend the money before you have it because by the time you get it, the year's over and you can't spend it anyway. So let's wait till it comes in and we'll budget for it in the ensuing budget as um, a project. So I just put that to the side there so they know it's there, but we try not to spend it if we aren't gonna have the money to spend until the end. One year we got it in September afterwards. And so it's like, uh, shoot, if we would have tried to spend that previous year, it would have been a whole year off. <clears throat> and then we have the Dayton government complex. We have approximately $15 million, a little bit over $15 million there towards that project. Uh, as of today, right now, we have $10 million in cash. So that includes the PILT that we anticipate getting in a couple of months in June, yeah, two months, uh, towards the middle of June. And a transfer from the general fund of 2.8 million. That, if our revenues significantly change over the next year, we may not be able to make that transfer into this fund. So we have a couple of options on this going forward. I would say that we push forward on both this project and the next one, which is the Justice Complex uh, District Court project. Push forward on those and get them all designed and ready to bid, and then see what's happened. If the economy is slowed down, you may get hungry contractors out there saying, hey, I will do it for less. If it hasn't slowed down, we have two options. We wait until we build up the cash before we bid it, or we go out and do some, some sort of bonding for the remaining portion of these projects. So I prefer not to bond because I don't like to pay interest. Those who understand it, interest earn it, and those who don't pay it. And I prefer to be on the first <laughs> if we have the choice for the county, because if we had bonded for the justice complex, we would not have half of what we do down there for the for the sheriff and all that. We would still be making payments on it right now. Half of that would have been interest over that time. So just so everyone's aware, we are not as rich of a county where we can afford to do a bond for this and that all of the time. It's easier for us to save up. We get a third more projects of the time frame done by not uh, bond bonding it uh, as we go. And then we'll move on to the public safety complex. This is out of the quarter cent sales tax that we have dedicated to that. It's, we should have through the end of next fiscal year, not this one, but next, approximately 8.132 million uh, saved up for that. Again, the project's probably gonna cost about 10 million. We might be able to push this forward if we, for short term, rob Peter pay Paul and use some of the cash we have saved up for the Dayton government complex towards this until the public safety sales tax catches up. The challenge with that project is that public safety sales tax may not come in as high as we're anticipating if the economy slows down or we go into a recession. So it may extend that time frame, just so everyone's aware. <clears throat> we have approximately $5.4 million in cash as of today saved up towards that project give you an idea of where we're at on that. And then Silver Springs Airport, Airport Improvements, our lease agreement requires us with the um, Silver Springs Airport, they pay us an annual lease of a little over $6,600. Well, it's a little bit more than that. They pay us an annual lease and based on rentals there. And we agree in the lease terms under our FAA grant provisions and the lease terms of them to set it aside for capital improvement matches for the FAA grants there. And so that's what that money's in. So those are all of the capital outlays. I'll touch on quickly as we go through uh, some of the different fund or departments of funds, but that's a high level overview of every capital outlay outside of utilities. Any questions? Yeah, real quickly, anybody uh, before Josh moves on? Seeing and hearing none. Mr. Foley, you're doing a good job. Okay, thank you. Uh, so with that being said, you can see other than our day-to-day -day operations where we need to make some repairs to or replacements on items, our two main projects for this upcoming year, probably for the next three to four upcoming years, are going to be that Dayton Government Complex and the District Court. We are saving up as much as we can towards those projects to get those done because of the statutory requirements we have at the Dayton Justice Court for jury trials that we're doing a Band-Aid approach on at the moment until we can get proper facilities. And then the, the upstairs at the Justice Complex, we've been waiting for a long time to get that moving forward and we want to get that project where it needs to be. 
So I will move on to the next tab, requested positions on page 11. Here's the good news in the budget. For the departments that uh, we were able to, we funded uh, with the funding we had, we were making recommendation to the board. We had recommend or requests for 11.675 FTD positions. I'm gonna go through these one by one and let you know what the funding is, the discussions we had with the department heads and why we recommended what we recommended with, with the funding. So in the district court, what they're requesting is an increase of 0.65 to court clerk, one position. So this is a little more intricate than that. They have had for the past probably four years a temporary position. It's a full-time position, but they wanted someone to, that they could hire that would go through every court document that they had and scan it into their case management system. And then they destroyed the hard copies of those files. They have a room that's about uh, half the size of the commissioner chambers. It was nothing but file storage. They have gone through almost all of that. They anticipate that project to be done by June 30th of this year. And we will, um, we will uh, go ahead and remove that position off. They also had a part-time position, 0.35 FTE, full-time equivalent employees that retired, that was a senior district court clerk. And so they are going, they're recommending we eliminate both of those positions and in the place of those, uh, put this position in, which is court clerk one. So it's shown as an upgrade to a position, but really you're losing 1.35 FTE and getting one back for it. And that was the thought process. The person who retired is a uh, court clerk that was providing juvenile services for the district court and they still need those services provided, but a full-time person accounts for the increased case that they produced. Then we'll move on to judicial master. The two, the two district court judges are very, very busy with what they do. They currently have a master paid for by the state and the district court judges' salaries are paid by the state as well, but they have a master that does child support hearings all the way. And so what they're requesting is that we hire a person, which the state will help fund part of this position, that will take care of those child support hearings. They will take care of custody hearings, 432B cases, which I hear the term. I know it refers to a statute. If you're interested, go to the statute and figure out what it is. I just know they want them to do those cases and some other cases as well. And so their recommendation is that we uh, do this. They've been asking this for a number of years, and they said we're finally to the point that we we really feel like it's necessary for the district court with the caseload to do this. And so that is built into the recommended budget. The physician would travel one day a week to Fernley. And the next week they would take a day and go to Dayton. The next week they would be in Urington uh, for the juvenile cases. The rest of the time they'd be here for child support hearings and the 432B cases and the other cases that the judges assigned to them as well. Just so you're aware of what that workload is. Dispatch uh, requested an upgrade to an existing position to become a supervisor position. We currently have two supervisor positions in dispatch, have had two supervisor positions since I've been here, and they currently don't have one of those filled. It's a vacant position. So our discussion with the sheriff and um, in that office was, you know what, would function fine with that. We can rotate those supervisors around so that during the day when the dispatch or the communications manager is there, she can function in that capacity if needed. But it's no change from existing operations not to fund this. We have some higher needs. When we went through those requests with the sheriff, we're like, you tell us if with the money we have, which positions you would request to be funded first. And so this was not one of the first positions. We went through and funded the first position in order the positions that you requested would be funded in the order that you requested. So we just didn't have enough money to get to this one and they've been functioning without. Um, and I don't think that is a, a significant position at this point. So we'll move on down to the sheriff's um, budget. He had requested two patrol deputies. 
Uh, we did not fund those in the recommended budget. He requested a sergeant. Um, again, on the sheriff's budget, he can assign those sergeants wherever he wants to. He can put them into patrol, he can put them into investigations, he can put them into whatever assignment he wants. The board just approves the position. So he re requested a sergeant that is built into the recommended budget, along with one of those nine vehicles as a new vehicle for this position. He requests an additional office assistant, which is included in the recommended budget. When you add additional positions for the sheriff's department or sheriff's office on the street, someone has to take care of the paperwork on the back end. We have added a number of positions over the past three years for the sheriff's office, but no support staff. And we're just at that threshold where that's a, a significant priority as well. So that's included in the recommended budget. We move on to the jail and he had requested a jail sergeant. My understanding is this will provide 24 seven supervision in the facility there. Uh, he likes to call it the hotel, so we'll go with that. And that is included in the recommended budget as well. We'll move on to the library manager uh, position. The library requested a, a library manager be created out of a library assistant position in Smith Valley. We evaluated that position with the library director. We took a look at the duties. That position is working out of class or potentially could be. And so our recommendation to the board is we make this a library manager position because to properly staff that branch, you need someone that is doing the duties of the library manager. And so that is included in the recommended budget. They did request an increase in hours of 0.15 FTE to that position. We didn't include that funding in the budget at this point. Then we move on to the senior parks maintenance worker. That was requested by parks and budget to hopefully decrease some contracted costs as we went forward, but it was gonna cost more than what those contracted costs were. And at this point, just trying to allocate the dollars to the highest need positions that didn't get funded in the recommended budget this year. We did increase a couple months ago as a position there. Hopefully we'll come back in a year and have a really good idea on what our cost savings would be, what capacity we have to reduce other contracts going forward. And then on senior services side in the silver and gold fund, we had a number of positions, uh, a transportation specialist position combining two into one in Fernley. You've already approved that at your last board meeting, combining it two into one, but this would also take it up to a full-time position. Um, we are having a significant challenge filling our transportation positions, filling our food service specialist positions, and the workload has been going up on those as well. So she requested 10 hours a week more on all of these positions in the budget. Uh, that is included in the recommended budget. We're hopeful we'll have an easier time filling these positions with more hours assigned to them. So if you, they'll make it more attractive in today's labor market for them to be able to come on board we may be back to the board at some point saying it's not enough, but we'll, we'll have those discussions as we go. And then in the utility side, they requested a construction repair tech one uh, that would be split between the water and sewer fund. That was not included in the recommended budget for funding purposes, just like the general fund. We're trying to figure out what positions to fund with the money that we have and keep those funds still financially feasible. Uh, his recommendation was of the three positions because there are two wastewater techs. He needed those two wastewater techs. We have added thousands of connections over the past few years with no additional staff. You can't operate a sewer plant long term in that type of situation. We need to have someone there doing the normal, normal repairs and maintenance so we aren't tripping over a dollar to pick up a dime. Because if we let that go too far, you're spending millions of dollars now and costs earlier than you need to. So we did build two wastewater tech positions along with vehicles associated with those into the budget for the utilities department. Those are all the new position requests. Do we have any discussion on that that you would like to have, Madam Chair? Uh, any discussion from the board? Uh, seeing none, and I 
I think we've lost Kenny somewhere along the line. I think he must have got to his destination. No, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, no, you are there. Okay. I didn't see you on the my board anymore. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but my whole system shut down and I had to reboot it. Oh, okay. So, again, uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Foley before we move on? Okay, well, there you go, Josh. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next tab, general fund, page 12. By the way, I hope the board likes the new presentation on these graphs because the graphs and the tables on each summary page is new this year. Um, we had some summary information previously, but this shows you the revenues in blue and the expenditures and, and transfers in red for you. Um, just a, a quick synopsis of the general fund. We already talked about the tax rate being moved. We talked about the utility license fees. We talked about the salaries. We have already talked about the position. So that's everything on the summary page, but just to, to give you a little bit more information, we are budgeting for the fund balance to decrease $4,353,859 next fiscal year. Now of that, if you take out the, the one-time transfer of 2.8 million to the capital improvements fund to help towards that Dayton government center out of fund balance and the contingency, we're actually spending $1,553,859 more than we're bringing in revenues. If you take out contingency and just say, what is it without contingency? We're spending about $222,000 $222,000 more than we're bringing in. Now, we have vacancies during the year, and so we do have savings from those. Turnover where a person retires or leaves and a new person comes in entry level. So we should be fine budgeting to spend more than we're bringing in. And we do have the contingency of 3%, which is currently set at the maximum allowed by statute. You can't put any more in contingency than 3%. We can let it increase fund balance, we can increase transfers, we can increase other things, but um, we don't do that. We also have a philosophy, which is recommended by Government Finance Officers Association. Why do they recommend it? Because it's a really good sense. And that is, we take a look at our ongoing revenues and our ongoing costs and match those up and see where we're at. And then we have one-time expenditures and we use those out of one-time revenues fund balance that ended up being higher than we thought it would be when we start the year and those type of things. And so as an example, the camera system and microphone system that we discussed for the commissioner chambers would have been out of one-time money. And so from fund balance, so we can allow that to flow into fund balance or we can move it into the transfer to the uh, capital improvements fund, or we can allocate it towards another one-time project, whatever the board chooses. But we want to try and keep those, I keep them separate in my mind and try and explain those separately as we go through those. The vehicles are ongoing. We're going to be paying for vehicles every year at this point. The HVAC units are quasi, they're one-time big projects, but you're probably going to see some projects like that almost every year. So I, I kind of play with those back and forth and, and try and classify those as one time when it's convenient for me. And, not the other times. <laughs> <laughs> so just so the board knows the philosophy on that. Uh, let's see. So revenues in the general fund over the current year, we're estimating them to go up approximately 7.3% if you exclude grants, as we talked about earlier. Ending fund balance will be budgeted at 11.6%. Our, our target is 16.6%. Again, we don't always spend everything that we we budget and so we should come in right around in that target frame without what's going to actually happen in the economy. We'll, not, we'll figure that out and play with that by ear as we go. The transfer to the, to the uh, capital improvements fund of $2.8 million, which is the amount of fund balance that we have sitting there um, that's available to be transferred over and above what the 11.67% the or 16.67%. And you're saying why that amount? It's two months worth of revenue. Our consolidated tax is always two months behind. And so we like the fund balance to be there because fund balance is not cash. If I were at June 30th and my fund balance was zero, I would be negative cash by about uh, $7 million. 
which I'm not allowed to do. And here's the way fund balance works. If Jeff Page owes me $8 million in consolidated tax that are gonna be collected in July and August, I include those in my fund balance. Do I have the cash? No, I'm not gonna have the cash until July and August. But if I spend down to zero fund balance, which a board did around 25 years ago, and the state came in and took over our finances for a little while <laughs> because the commissioners were not grasping the difference between fund balance and actual cash. So when we take a look at this, you have to have a fund balance there because we're booking in money that it, we haven't received yet. So two months worth gives you the ability Half of your revenue comes from consolidated tax. It allows you to get that money in um, and have cash at June 30th, just for the board's view. So we try and learn from our mistakes in the past as much as possible. Okay, so we'll move on at this point then. Let's move on to tab, tab two, which is on page 26. We're gonna go to the commissioners. Two things of notice on this one. One we've already discussed. One was the microphone system. We're going to be removing that out of the capital outlay request. The other one is there is um, agenda software, new agenda software built into this in the upcoming year. It's going to be approximately $20,000 for the purchase of the software and implementation, and then $10,000 a year in ongoing licenses. We're currently paying a little over $5,000 a year for our existing software and ongoing license costs. So that is what tab did we jump to? Sorry, to tab two, which would be page 26. And this is where it starts to speed up because we've talked about 95% of what we're going to talk about. And I'm just going to hit some highlights in the, some of the departments and then answer questions at any time. Um, so that is recommended and built into the budget for this next year. Did you have any questions or discussion on that? On, on the agenda software? No. Okay, on this, okay, so then we'll move on. Uh, let's see, let's move on to page 48, which would be tab six. Well, well, well before we do that. Yes, <laughs> you have some questions. I, I, I just have a comment on, yes. on this yeah. tab. You know, we have um, $10,000 budget for travel, you know, which, you know, I understand. and. I'm just concerned. I wonder if that's enough. I mean, there are three national NACO events a year that hopefully we will have participation on. Plus there is the Nevada NACO event. I know that we funded a couple of things this year out of contingency. And I was wondering if we might want to bump that up. So we're not having to, to move money for, from contingency to, to cover travel that, that we can anticipate. And since we're not spending $66,000 on uh, cameras and microphone. I like to see us put about, I don't know, maybe five more thousand in that, but that's just my thought. Okay. And just so the board is aware, uh, Commissioner Henderson discussed that that budget covers the Nevada NACO conference to send the commissioners and Mr. Page to that. It does any travel that the commissioners do for the under the travel policy for the commissioners and what the county manager does as well for for that so and any that Aaron may do as well so that's what the budget is built around it doesn't contemplate as Commissioner Henderson pointed out doesn't contemplate any national conferences so or additional above what I mean so if you want additional put into the budget now is the best time to have that discussion Madam Chair I, if, I may, if, if the board wishes to add more funding to travel for the NACO conferences then you better add about $30,000 instead of $5,000, depending on how many commissioners you're going to send. There are three major national events that the board may be interested in, the National Conference, and then the Western Region Conference, and then the Public Lands Conference. And as an example, one, I believe the Western Region right now is in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, so flights are expensive to go. Um, depending on how many commissioners you're going to send, you may want to increase that from 5,000 to a substantially more amount of money. My recommendation is um, if, we're, if we're cutting dollars to save money, maybe we hold back and only send one commissioner to National NACO um, versus trying to send two or three commissioners to each National NACO event. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, in years past, um, you know, we usually only sent one commissioner, if anybody, 
to those types of events. Um, I do know, we, you know, that last time around the Washington trip, we were going to send three that got canceled um, by the individuals. And I thank you very much for doing that. Um, but yeah, I, if, if we're going to send anybody, I mean, we only should only cut expense for one uh, moving forward. Uh, that's my thought. Um, Commissioner Gray, you have your hand up. I do, I agree. These are, these are nice to have, not necessities. And uh, yeah, I would not recommend upping that at all, um, especially when we have Commissioner Hockaday, who still has flight travel credit that can be used, uh, you know, should we decide to send him to national or something. Okay, uh, any of the commissioners and chambers have comment? Uh, Commissioner Hockaday here. Uh, yeah, I don't like to ever, you know, overspend, but uh, travel has just about doubled from the last six months. So I do have to agree that we may be a little short on that even for one person going to each uh, conference. So just something to consider. Like the, they, they have said, uh, I think it was two nights ago on the news that it's like 50% more to travel. So it could be tough uh, making that budget. Uh, Commissioner Jacobson, I wasn't sure if you had any comment. I'm uh, conservative by nature and uh, I'm all for just sending one to conferences and uh, I will gladly vote for any of you four to go to the conferences. Thank you. Well, and so I wanted to point out something as well, even if we only budget for one, um, that doesn't exclude others. Um, if they want to go attend on their own dime, um, they can still be there. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of things on my own dime and don't uh, send in requests to the county for reimbursement. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I would like to stick with one and uh, go from there. So, so Josh, the way you have this budgeted, do we need to still add money to cover just the one? If that cost to go to a national event is about two thousand dollars for a commissioner, I would say we would want to add approximately uh, six thousand dollars for three events. If you're going to send one to each one of those three events. Okay. So I, I would suggest because it's it's not it's not two thousand um, dollars. What we were looking at sending um, three commissioners to D.C. for the National Legislative Conference. It was about three grand per commissioner to go. So I would suggest that we take a look at adding an additional ten thousand dollars to that budget. If we don't spend it, then it go we're we're okay. Um, we can be used utilized for other things or kept as savings for the next fiscal year. I would agree with that. Um, again, uh, my other commissioners, any comments? Yeah, just, uh, I, you know, very. I'm a very conservative guy, again, when it comes to finances. Um, we do have some travel money, like I said, left from uh, Commissioner Hockaday's. I would say we just hold it back and just, um, you know, if we, I, I don't think we have to send anybody to National or any of the other ones. They're nice to have. But, um, you know, I would just say we sit on this budget for now and, uh, you know, we plan on sending people to uh, our state conference that we do each year and just hold back. And then, you know, if we look at it later on, there's a real compelling reason to send one or more people. We look at it then. I, I, I disagree with that. I think the attendance at national events is very important and something that, that we should participate in. Not disagreeing, but it's, you know, when we're tightening our belts and uh, the cost is skyrocketing, you know, it's, I, I, you know, there are other ways we can attend. Uh, each of the NACO events lately have been available by Zoom, which is a, uh, it's not a perfect answer, but it's an answer. So Madam Chair, um, yes. if I may, so the rec, it, it, to send one to these conferences, it's recommended increase 10,000. If we don't spend it, we can reallocate that. Is that correct? But if we don't allocate it, we can't spend it. Uh, then I think That's the recommendation to attend these, it, I would say we move the 10 grand over and, and, uh, and if we don't use it, we don't use it. But, um, I do agree that having, having representation at these conferences is, is a valuable, is a, it definitely adds value. So. Okay, Josh. So I, I'm hearing that, uh, 
let's uh, put an earmark there for the 10,000 extra and we'll add that to the end of this meeting. Okay, thank you. I have uh, made that note so I don't have to wait and, and write that down. We'll just keep moving forward. Uh, let's move on to page 48, which will be tab six in the commissioner's binders. This is the facilities department. I just wanted to highlight that part of the uh, requests and special projects, there's $40,000 to demolish the blue building next to the McAtee building in Silver Springs. It's uh, been deemed unsafe. It's an old uh, masonry structure there. We've been wanting to remove that and create a parking lot for the sheriff's office at that location for many years. And so it's in the recommended budget for this upcoming year. Again, this would be an example of one of those one-time expenditures that we have that come up. Um, I don't know, can we tear it down? I thought it was historic. It's <laughs> joking. <laughs> okay. And then uh, at Silver Springs Juvenile Probation, they've requested a fence to be put up around part of that property as well. That's approximately just under $20,000 to do that. They end up with, um, with homeless people sleeping around the building at times, and it's a, a staff and public concern in that location. So that's built in. We're looking at doing some recarpeting. Again, those aren't capital projects, but just so you know, they're in that budget. And then we already discussed the HVAC um, discussions for the capital and the request for vehicle. If there are no questions there, let's move on to tab 65, or tab five, page 65. Okay, you just could I, Madam yeah. Chair, could I ask that we go to page 56? 56 would be the salaries budget. Um, actually, my question, I just looked at it closer. My question got answered by me. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. <laughs> okay, so with that being the case, we'll move on to tab nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear you clear the first time. It's at yeah. five. And <laughs> tab nine on page 65. And just so you know, there's an increase to the software program uh, line item for software of uh, almost $24,000. This is to purchase additional security software that if in the case there is a breach of our defenses, it will go in and will shut down the computer as soon as it identifies that that computer has been infected. Um, it's a, with the things that are going on in the world today, there are significantly increased security risks and threats on the IT side. And we feel like this is something that we responsibly should bring up with that type of activity, especially governments being targeted. We have a number of security systems in place. I'm not gonna go through all of them. This would put an additional one in to uh, to provide that additional security, well paid for, even if we prevent a single event happening. So we'll move on to tab 13 on page 84. So this is the district attorney's budget. I wanna let you know, we had significant discussion at a previous board meeting about how we conduct salary studies and adjust salaries as we go up. We have a district attorney position that has been vacant for, the deputy district attorney position has been vacant for many months now. Uh, we are seeing that they are under in the market significantly. And so we're recommending in the recommended budget to adjust those salary ranges for the, those positions. So the L1, there are four pay ranges, L1, which is a law clerk, which is actually in the district court budget, but to increase that by 7%, that range. And then L2 is a deputy DA, and you start out in the DA, and that would increase it by 8%, that salary range. L3 is 6% for the senior deputy DA, that would be the increase. And then the L4 for the chief deputy DA would be 3%. So that's built into this budget. We also built in a stipend of approximately $300 per month for each DA. That is intended to cover going to covering the weekends on the 48 hour bail hearings. And when we're looking at our competitor counties for this talent, they're doing that amount or more. And so we're just trying to 
keep these positions so that we can have people in seats for this year's terms of office. That's a good question. Oh, no, just just a, just a comment, if, if I may. Um, and I I think I know the answer to this. I'm going to ask it anyway. Are we keeping track of what the going to the 48 hour bill hearings is costing us? Yeah, in other words, yeah, added expenses here, added expenses there. Are, are we are we keeping track of that? Yes. Because at some point that may be information that could be used for a BDR to try to get some kind of relief from, I don't think requirement's gonna go away, but maybe we can get some additional funding from the state to help pay for that since they're requiring it. So I, 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 was, I, was, I figured you were keeping track of it, but I just wanted to make sure that we were. And just so you know, there's also an increase of approximately $5,000 in overtime for this budget for the administrative staff as needed to work weekends because they don't, they don't, they're not salaried, and so we're not doing a stipend, but they do get the overtime to be there. We also did approximately $5,000 each one of the justice courts in increasing overtime for this as well, just so everyone's aware. And also, didn't we uh, talk about the $555,000 to get extra people for next year because of that uh, bail reform? So we that have was that. all taken care of. We're keeping track of that as well. Yes. And the additional and the public guardian or the public defender's budget. Too. Yes, we we have that. Um, so let's move on to. And I'm going to skip over anything we've already talked about previously. Let's move to tab 19, page 116. And this is the Walker River Justice Court. And I'm not going to hit each one of the justice courts, but I wanted to emphasize that we have an increase for 4% for the justice fee salary for that. We also have the increase in overtime. We have separated out the judge pro tem costs that they're doing, and that is going to increase as part of the 48 hour barrel hearings as well, because what we're what we're doing is we're negotiating contract that will come back to the Board of County Commissioners to provide an additional person so that instead of three JPs rotating every third weekend, we toss another contract position in the mix so that they, once a month, will have to do that. And they can work Bless that you. themselves. Thank you. So I just wanted to note that out. That's the same for each of the three justice groups. So ones uh, let's move on to tab 22. Jeff's not here, he stepped out. So. Whoa. I'll just do it by, by ear for everyone else. This is the juvenile probation department. They're requesting security cameras out of their office supplies budget of approximately $20,000 to put in a security camera system in three of their locations. That would be in Dayton, Silver Springs, and Urington. They already have one in Fern, a system that's up there. And so that would have cameras and recording if they have any issues that happen on that site. We have that ability. We have over the years for camera systems as we can afford each budget to do that. And this is their request and it is included in the funding budget. So we'll move on to tab 23, page 139. This is a public defender budget. This has gone up approximately 55% in this current year and another 14% in the upcoming fiscal year. The reason for the increase is the requirements that we have from DIDS, uh, Department of Energy and Defense Services of the state, now that they're in charge of that. So we have significantly increased costs in, in uh, defense for indigent individuals. And that's what this captures is the indigent costs. And anything by state law that's over $883,183 is eligible for reimbursement from the state provided that they have funding for it. So we have built into the budget that we're going to be reimbursed the difference between the 1.317 uh, million and the 183,000. So that's shown on the revenue side as well. There may, this is also where we're going to be tracking the murder costs um, for the indigent side, assuming it ends up being an indigent cost and it will be in this budget as well. 
which we've already uh, discussed and are bringing back a contract or doing a contract for, we have to have someone who's certified in capital cases to be on that case. So we, we're paying an attorney for that as well, in addition to the public defender contract. So this has gone up significantly. There is a chance that the state will change the law and say, we're not, you know, this is a county responsibility when things get tight. We hope that doesn't occur. We're not wanting to sell that to the legislature that it occur, but we keep an eye on this as we go forward, just to be aware. Uh, the public defender contract is requested to go up $150,000 for our contract public defender. That's to increase staffing again for the 48 hour bail hearings to provide, it doesn't even cover fully the term, but he's going to add an attorney and administrative person um, with use some of that funding towards that is our understanding. So if they can cover the, the weekends on that. Let's move on. Mr. Foley. Yes. We've got more than one request. I, I should have grabbed you before you got to that last one uh, for a break. Okay. So if, uh, I don't know, they want five minutes or whatever. So take a short break here. Sounds good. Oh, there it is. Okay, hang on one second. Make sure I'm on mute.
Jeff, let me know when everybody's back. Madam Chair, okay. Yeah, you had me muted. I yelled at you, but you didn't answer. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if we could please take note that Commissioner Gray has dropped off um, the Zoom. So we are uh, left with the remaining four commissioners. So Mr. Foley. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Floyd Lyon County Council, the record. If we can go to tab 25, which would be page 146. This is the Animal Control Department. There is a request that's included in the recommended budget for $34,860 to equip the surgery room at the shelter to help. Uh, keep the costs down for spays and neuters for the public and the facility as well. Um, so let's move on to tab 26, page 152. <clears throat> this is a sheriff's department budget. I wanted to highlight that the special investigations is requesting new interview systems, cameras, microphones, recording equipment for the four substations, approximately $78,000 to do that. They would end up with a uniform system or interface. So depending on which sub they go to, it operates the same no matter what. And the systems that we do have are antiquated and the cameras are um, out of production. You can't even get them anymore when you need to replace them. So it is time. <clears throat> then let's move on to tab 30, which is on page 180. This is the cemetery budget. And it does include a request for um, new software. It also has, which was funded, it also has a request for engineering um, for approximately seven, $8,000 or so for the Silver City Cemetery, which was not included in the recommended budget. So just so the board gets the background on this, and again, this is one that you may want discussion on. <clears throat> the Silver City Cemetery is almost completely full. A few years back, we had decided as the Board of County Commissioners to purchase a lot adjacent to it so that we could expand that cemetery. The thought process at the time was 
we're going to buy that. We're working with the Comstock mine up there, and they're going to come in and provide fill from that mine to bring that up to grade because right now it is very rocky. It is not suitable for a cemetery. You actually have to add at least six feet of fill so that you can dig down six feet to <clears throat> utilize that um, as a graveyard site. And so with that being said, the discussions with the mine over the years have changed and they're no longer offering to bring fill for various reasons to that property. It would cost, I'm guessing a few hundred thousand dollars to just bring fill into that. There's no requirement under state statute to uh, expand the cemeteries. We do have cemeteries in Dayton. There are cemeteries in, in surrounding communities that, that can be used. And it's up to the board if they want to discuss this, but for the recommended budget, it was not included in the recommended budget for those reasons. Okay, any discussion? I, I, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, th thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, this is, okay, so the, the, the county purchased this lot with the intent of expanding the cemetery. Uh, but the lot's not suitable for a cemetery use without a lot of expense. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I understand the, the problem that the, the people in, in Silver City have, and, and I empathize with that. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing us go ahead and, and fund the engineering for that, or as an alternative, maybe include some money to look for an alternative location in Silver City for a cemetery. I mean, I realize that we have, a, there's no requirement, but people live in Silver City, they don't, they don't want to be buried Dayton, <laughs> you know, or anywhere else. Um, I, I know there's an ARPA request for this, so I, I think it, it, at this point, I'm willing to go with the recommendations as to not fund it out of this, but just want to put it on record that should the ARPA funding not be used or then we may want to come back and, and, and look at doing something. We've got to do something for the people in Silver City. You know, we, we really do. Um, I don't know what we're going to do with that lot. <laughs> if we're not going to use it for that, if it's got any, any cash value or not. But we do need to do something as, as a board for to, to look at the cemetery situation in Silver City. But like, like I said, for, for the budget, I'm going to go with your recommendation. Okay. Any other commissioner comments? Okay. And Josh, at this time, um, yeah, I'm going to agree that, uh, yeah, we don't need to spend that kind of money um, for that lot. Um, so I'm going to go with your recommendation that we don't fund that at this time. Okay. Thank you. Well, with that, we'll move on then to tab 34, page 189. <clears throat> this is a library budget. We already discussed about the library manager <coughs> position. The, there was another request. We are at another one of those lovely junction points where Windows is saying uh, you're going to have to upgrade and the, other, the older versions are not going to be supported anymore. And so you have to upgrade to Windows 11. Well, none of the patron computers are capable of running Windows 11. So the request in the budget was for approximately almost $40,000 to purchase all of those patron computers. The good news is we have approximately three years before we have to move to the Windows 11 platform and discontinue using the old ones. So with that, we discussed with the library director would you be agreeable for us in the recommended budget to just recommend a third of those computers this year, a third in the next year, and a third in the year after? That way we don't have a whole group of computers needing to be replaced at once in the future as well. It kind of phases them in over time, and we don't have the cost all at once, and you get better computers over time as you go too because um, they progress. And so she was agreeable to that, so the recommended budget does include just one-third of that initial request. Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you. Um, Mr. Foley, I'm curious. 
I had this written down earlier and I, and I neglected to ask it, but I would like to. The librarian position at Smith Valley, we're increasing that. Is that correct? We're not increasing the number of hours. What we are doing is changing it from a library assistant position to a library manager position. And that is included in the record in the budget. But um, this wasn't one of the positions where we in increased hours in the record. So it's basically a pay raise and a title. Pay raise and a title. And what we're doing is we're paying someone for the job description of the work that they're going to be doing. Yeah. And so the expectations are increased, I guess you could say. I, yes. I would, actually, I would say that we probably probably already doing this. the job or they're doing the job of that. And so we're just catching up. All right. I was just curious if it was based on the amount of use and do they track usage in libraries or? Yeah. They, oh, yes. They do track the usage in the library. She has fantastic statistics that she shares with the board occasionally. Um, but yes, they, they do track that usage. We, again, we want to make sure that we're paying people for the work that they're performing. Right. So that's the recommendation. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments or questions at this time? Okay, Mr. Foley. Okay, let's skip all the way back to the cooperative extension tab. And this is on page 264. <clears throat> we used to have a full-time employee at the county and then the additional uh, staffing was provided at the state level because the state oversees the cooperative extension program statewide. When our employee retired approximately a year ago, the state came to us and said, we would prefer just to have all the employees at the state level and the county just reimburse us through the contract services. So that's what we're doing here. They did have a request because previously they'd come in and requested a certain dollar amount. I think it was that we would fund 20% of the 4-H uh, community-based instructor. They're requesting us to fund 80%. It's still within the one cent tax rate that we have to fund. It seems like a good use of the funds and they're running the program. So I just wanted to make note that that request was in here and it's in the recommended budget. It's kind of funny how the state share tends to shrink over time <laughs> in a lot of areas. It does. And then they're, they're also asking um, for a match for a grant and also for a short-term livestock specialist for $12,711. Be provided in one time funding out of this. There's enough tax rate to cover their request. So we're, it's in the recommended budget as well. Okay, let's move on to the next tab, the road fund. I want to note, uh, sorry, 270. So the road fund, I want to note that we've increased the utility license fees. We've talked about this previously by $200,000. We've also changed the salary allocation for a mechanic that was split, actually works in Dayton. And uh, they, instead of making people drive all the way to Urington that have vehicles in Dayton, county vehicles, we have been for many years servicing them in the Dayton shop. But that mechanic is now doing more and more work on the utility side than on the road side. And so that, uh, that particular mechanic, the share has been changed slightly. So you're gonna see the full-time equivalent employees decrease in this fund just because they're getting less of a share of that person over time. So I wanted to, to point that out. The other thing is, um, as we watch this fund, we talked about the gas tax revenues probably are not going to be what we projected them to be for the next year because those projections came out in February, you know, March timeframe before we ended up with all of the, the sanctions and all of the impacts that we've seen from that. And then, then again, of course, there's always a talk about a, a gas tax holiday to uh, combat the high price of, of fuel, which would really just be a disaster for us. It would be very, very challenging. Yes, disasters if you could look. Uh, let's move on to the human services tab, and we'll go to page 288. This is the general indigent fund. This is uh, Human Services Department, all of Shayla's, uh, other than medical indigent and senior centers, that's what's paid for out of this. They did have a request to for additional tax rate in this fund. They get levied a tax rate, but 
there's no recommended additional taxes going into this. They lost a grant and they're like, we want to keep these people. The good news is, is the marijuana revenue that we get from the state that we put into here because there was a new dispensary added this last year, that increased by a few tens of thousands of dollars. And so that money is going in here. So instead of increasing the tax rate, we just said, hey, you already have an increase. And so we're, we think we're good with that. Um, let's move on to, in the same tab, uh, to page 302. This is the medical energy fund. I just wanted to note that 1.7 cents of this tax rate we talked about got moved out of this. So what's left is we have 8 cents, which is the maximum amount that we have to pay towards the state Medicare match program. The state covers anything over, we're capped at 8 cents of our tax rate of what we have to pay. And then by state law, we have to levy a cent and a half for the state indigent accident fund and one cent for the state supplemental fund. So those, we're just a pass through. We get the money and we send it off to the state. Um, really all three of those, but that's that's the tax rate that comes in here. The good news as well, be, the reason we built up a fund balance over the years because some years we do not spend the whole eight cents. And so they only bill us what we actually spend. And so we keep that as fund balance. We can use some of this fund balance towards the government center because they're going, we're going to have human services in there. So we're not quite, we may have another couple hundred, four or 500,000 that we can use out of this fund towards it. It doesn't get us the millions of dollars we need, but it does help towards it, just like the um, court facility fees can help towards it. So, just a quick question because I didn't catch that 1.5 cents for the state indigent accident fund. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. I'll let you probably are an expert in this. It, yeah, it, being with Naker. The, the engine accident fund, this goes into a, a, a fund. And then when an engine person has an accident, it depends on where the accident is. If the accident happens in Lyon County, Lyon County is responsible for those medical bills. This program is actually um, run by NACO. NACO oversees this fund on, on a grant from the state. But that, that's, it, it goes to pay for medical expenses for indigent people that are injured in the state of Nevada no matter where they're from. And a lot of that funding goes straight to the hospitals. Yes. However, in recent years, some of that money has come back to the counties. A couple hundred thousand was put back in to this fund this, this year through that NACO. NACO has changed um, on the excess what we're doing with some of that. So it does come back into this fund. And, and the, re the reason that it, it goes through NACO is it provided um, the larger urban hospitals with trauma centers, those kinds of things, a single point of contact to deal with in regards to billing versus the old days where every county would get a bill and then it would be confused as to whether, um, you know, you take the I-80 issue as an example. Um, if it's at mile marker 53, it's in Lyon County. If it's mile marker 54, it's in Churchill County. Um, it provided a one-stop shop for those medical facilities to get um, reimbursed uh, quicker than later. Um, so that we can keep them um, fiscally whole from those types of situations. So th that that um, process has been in place now for a long time, 20 plus years, that, as far as I know. Thanks. Okay, then let's go ahead and move on to the capital improvements tab, which is on page 353. <clears throat> Again, I wanted to reemphasize the, the funding that's going to be coming out of this. We have the approximately $15 million towards the Dayton Government Center, a little over $8 million for the district court remodel and expansion. I do want everyone to be aware, we used to put a tax rate into this fund and we ceased doing that. That tax rate needed to be shared with the cities um, years ago, and, or I should say into the road fund. And that was shared with the cities. We took the tax rate out of that and we use our utility license fees in the road fund instead, uh, which are generated outside the cities. The cities have their own utility license fees that they can collect, they can use towards roads if they wish to. But to make up the difference out of this fund, we fund the cities for roads every year, $180,000 to the city of Fernley and $20,000 to the city of Barrington. We pay it to them in quarterly installments each year. 
So there's 200,000 out of this fund that we take out of our payment loop taxes and fund those to the cities. So you're aware. Um, let's move. Was the ending fund, oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, That's okay. It, it was the ending fund balance. Is that line broken on this chart or is that correct? So we, <laughs> this is, a, <laughs> it is correct. We are, we budget some of these to spend 100% of the money so we can spend it all during the year. Same as we talked about the park construction tax so on the capital improvements fund. We budget it so that we can spend it during the year as we go because we're not sure exactly how much is actually going to go out during the year. We have the projects, but we don't have the <clears throat> So, yeah, it's nice to have that ending fund balance line to see, even if it's broken. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's. Let's move on to the utilities tab and page 374 on Dayton Water Fund. So you have five years of history here. You can see there was a request for three quarters of a new position. Actually, it was a full new position, three quarters here, a quarter out of sewer that wasn't funded for that position and the recommended. You can see the, uh, the requested expenses are more than the revenues for the next and recommended the same way for the next fiscal year. So keep in mind, when you hear double digit inflation numbers out there, we are seeing significantly more than that for some of the things that the utilities purchases. Because when they're purchasing pipe, replacement pipes, those type of things, if they can even get them, they have gone up much more than just what your CPI is going up out there. And, uh, we had some discussion, which is going to be on a future agenda, as can we forego the rate increases on these funds going forward? The challenge for us is we realize the impact that inflation is having on our rate payers out there. We realize the impact that these rate increases are having. But the reality is we still have to provide water to them when they turn the tap on or sewer when they flush the toilet. And those costs are going up significantly higher than what those inflation costs that we're seeing in the news are. And so when we're looking at these, we have that piece. And in addition to that, we have our bond covenant where we signed a $20 million bond and these revenues need to cover both this and water and sewer together. We have to have enough of a quote unquote profit to make those payments. We haven't started making any payments on that yet. We're gonna pay interest only on the sewer side until we draw down that full $20 million on those projects, which may be over the next year or two years, depending on how quickly MDP turns around on some of those things. Uh, but the reason the rates are set the way they are and the is to cover those bond payments. And that was before we contemplated this type of inflation occurring on our prices. So I just wanted to, to point that out to you I don't believe we're gonna be able to defer those rate increases. My recommendation to the board is gonna be not, not a necessarily a discussion item for today, but that can be included in the budget discussion as well, so that you're aware. So with that being said, um, I want to move to page 36, no, 384 which is the water capital improvement fund. This is not including the fleet, their vehicle purchases, those type of purchases. But I wanna show you the capital projects that are built into this budget, the recommended budget for next year. We are looking at approximately $8.5 million in capital costs for this next year. Majority of that is a water tank on 10 mile road because we are to the point with Copper Canyon and all the other developments going on, we need additional water storage in that area. Uh, not just Copper Canyon, they have a lot of different developments that are happening throughout the state. And so that's in there. If you take a look at the next year, we have almost $5 million. At that point, we run out of cash. And you can see the next year beyond that, 7 million, and the year after that's $25 million. So the good news is, is we monitor the cash flow very carefully. We only put in the current year the most necessary things. And 
if we get to a point, I told the utilities director, we're going to play this year by year, and we're going to go through year by year and see where we're at. If we get to a point that we have problems, our options are we, we bond, but you have to have the rates to bond. And so we're going to take a look at that or we defer some of these projects. Now, if growth doesn't occur, some of these projects don't have to happen as much, but some of them have to. You have to replace some of the lines that are when they fail and those type of things. So we're just going to keep an eye on this. What I want you to take away from this discussion is we're on a razor thin line with these utility funds as far as being able to take care of the replacement things that we need to and the expansion things that we need to as we go along. We are getting connection fees coming in as we go. Um, and so that does help for some of these costs, but we, it's not one of those where we can um, just say, hey, well, that doesn't happen. I'm, I'm just at the dumb part, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> just just a, a quick question and for curiosity more than anything else. And if you know, how big of a water tank is that? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I'm thinking it's a two million gallon tank. Excuse me. I think it's a two million ga gallon tank. But Mr. Burketta, if he's listening, can probably help us there. Uh, Commissioner, hi. This is David Burketta. For the record, um, yeah, it's just under a one million gallon uh, storage tank. It's a lot, a lot of money for a big cylinder, <laughs> basically. Yes. But I'm sure there's reasons. Yeah, they're not cheap. Oh, I'm sure of that. No, they're not. Okay, so let's move on to page. Um, didn't write this one down. I apologize, but we will get there. Let's go to page 386, the Dayton Sewer Fund. I want to point out that they requested two and a quarter employees. We did recommend funding of two employees. Now, keep in mind, the Dayton Sewer Fund contracts with the Silver, Silver Springs General Employment <coughs> District to provide staffing services for that sewer plant in Silver Springs. So currently, we're doing a part of a position allocating by contract services. We, we did a journal entry for the bill between the two of them. And it goes in contract services as an expense. On the GID side, on this side, we show as revenue. Well, that plant needs additional people. Again, just like we're talking to additional people for, for this to keep it running properly. So half of one of these new positions is paid for out of that charge to the Silver Springs GID. That is built into both budgets, just so you're aware. And um, it's not like we send over half an employee over there and and get done, you may send over two or three employees and, and get it taken care of for a week, and come back or those type of things. But that's how we're funding part of one of those employees. Um, and then we are changing allocations slightly between water and sewer based on actual hours worked in the past year on estimates. If we take a look at the graph, you can see the revenues for next year exceed the expenditures by $571,000. What that does not include on the expense, I should say expense side, is it does, that includes just the interest on the debt that they have. Principal payments are $673,000 a year. So if you take a look at that, compare revenues to expenditure or expenses, and then you add the principal, which is on the cash flow side, it doesn't even show up in this. We're actually requesting more money than we're bringing in. Now we don't always spend all of our budget, we can't put contingency in these funds, so we end up budgeting a little more in each of these line items. But when you look at it, it looks like you have a profit of $600,000 almost. You really don't. You really have a deficit of about $50,000. Just so everyone's aware. And again, the exact same discussion we had on the water side as far as um, where we're at funding-wise and being able to defer. But let's go on to page. Can I ask a question? First, I mean, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, the, the, the position that we that you recommend that we not fund that split, I guess, three quarters and a quarter that was a, a maintenance tech. Yes. What exactly would that person be doing? 
when your water stops flowing and someone has to go out and figure it out and dig up the ground and replace the pipe or the valve or whatever it happens to be, the water main, that's that person. It's not the person that sits at the, or works at the plant, sits the wrong word, works at the plant and takes care of the treatment equipment. It's actually the person that's out in the field repair, repairing or doing any maintenance on the stuff out on those, those type of things where they're physically replacing items in those type of things in the transmission distribution lines. In this particular case, and, collection lines as well. And, and we, obviously we have people doing that job now. We do. This is just a request for an additional person. Yes, sir. Okay, because I, I want I want to mull that one over. Some, some, not not today, but between the, the tentative budget and the final budget, I, I want to mull that one over a little bit. And I would love to fund that position as well. My problem is I have a bond covenant I have to keep, and right. we have to be able to pay for everything that we need to pay for. And it, it, that uh, Tetris piece didn't fit into the puzzle. <laughs> it took us over the top, and the game was over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to page three ninety six. Dayton sewer fund. These are the capital projects built into, not including the fleet. That's on the next page where they're buying vehicles. But these are the capital projects that are built in. You can see for the next fiscal year, we have almost twenty one million dollars there, and then the year after, we have approximately seventeen million dollars. What that gets you. For the most part, of the three projects you have in the pipe, and we have approximately $16 million more in bonding that we're going to draw down out of that 20 million. So we are broke out of cash in about two and a half years from now. That's fine. Now we are bringing in revenue each month. We are bringing in um, connection fees currently, although growth slows down, that slows down. If you look at the year after, you've got almost $11 million in capital requests scheduled for that year, and, and then $6 million a year after, $3 million a year after. We'll probably scale these back. We're doing the same approach, but again, same message as the water fund. We are on a knife's edge on these particular uh, mm -hmm. funds, and so we are trying to balance out that cash and make sure that we're able to continue to provide those services. So, with that being said, that's it for the county side. Now we have the special districts. So Madam Chair, um, we can either on the county side, you can go through and have your adopt the budget and then we can go into the special districts or we can go into them and come back and have that discussion. But that's all I have for the county budget itself okay well before we move on um now that we've gotten through all the county side do i have any commissioners in chambers that had questions on items that josh didn't bring up um madam chair um, yes if i may this is commissioner jacobson um so mr foley um it seemed like it was that last meeting or we were discussing the contingency fund and how it was getting very thin. You didn't say broke. Okay. That's good. But then um, what, what some things that put us in that situation, um, is there something that we've learned from that, that we can maybe try to avoid this year um, or, so something that that we can do a better job of um, as a as a uh, board of commissioners to help make sure that we don't uh, get strapped, so to speak. Um, you, you don't like to come down to the end and, and all of a sudden something happens and we have no contingency funds left. So is there something there that that maybe we missed as a board? So I would say that we've done a pretty good job. We've been a little more, we've been a little more liberal with departments. And I don't mean that as a bad term because they're, they're not requesting uh, pie in the sky type of things, but we've, we've allowed departments to come in on a regular basis throughout the year for all sorts of different projects throughout the year, instead of saying, 
come in at budget time, this is your budget for the next year, unless there's something really unusual that happens, don't come talk to us again about additional money until we get to budget time next year. So that's a shift that we've uh, accommodated as, as we've um, become a little more, a little less strapped, if you will. And we may have to go back to that philosophy of, you know what, great idea, fantastic idea, bring it up. In Let's budget, budget we'll next year. In the budget next year instead of during contingency. Because we have some departments that literally on a weekly basis, I get an email from and say, hey, I need this or I need that. And it's not the budget. How do I do this? Now, sometimes it's stuff. It's like, yeah, we got to do that. Sometimes it's stuff. It's like, well, if you put in your budget request, it doesn't have to be today. You can get that in July. And, it would be fine. and so we may have to change to that kind of uh, philosophy as we go. But part of it, we'll just have to play by ear and weigh each request as it comes in. Roger that. And then I just want to touch on something that Commissioner Henderson mentioned earlier today, and I think is a great idea as far as the BDR regarding um, some of that unexpected cost uh, um, increases, et cetera, from the 48 hour bail hearing. Um, I think I think that would be a wonderful idea that other counties would probably get behind as well. And I think that would actually be a BDR that would have a chance. Um, but again, you probably need some historical or some figures and numbers, and you don't want to go in there, you know, saying, well, this are anticipated costs as, and as opposed to this is the actual cost to our county. Uh, thank you for doing that to us. Um, and I might, um, let me look through my notes, Madam Chair, but um, I'm going to, I'm good for right now. Okay. Uh, any other commissioner? Uh, yes, Ma Madam Chair. Commissioner Henderson. Vice Chair, sorry. Um, so if I'm reading this right, our recommended contingency for next year is 1.3 million. Okay. And just to clarify that to, to the board, when we talk about contingency, 95% of the time we are talking about general fund contingency. We're allowed to put up to, we don't have to do any, but we're allowed to put up to 3% by statute of whatever the expenditures are, um, put 3% set aside in contingency and just, and that's the calculation. We also have contingency in the road fund budget has its own contingency of 3%. The general indigent fund, the silver and gold fund, those two I added this year, that's new because they haven't had them in the past. And I'm like, we really should be doing it for those as well because food prices are gonna be going up for the senior centers and some of the other housing prices have continued to go up. And then the cooperative extension also has a contingency, as does the fair and road fund, just so you're aware on all of those. So when we talk about contingency, most of the time, almost all of the time, you're dealing with, with contingency in the general fund, but occasionally we end up with some of those other buckets. Okay, so then to clarify my question, <laughs> the contingency in the general fund is 1.3 million. Approximately, yes. Thank sir. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Yeah, Commissioner Hockett here. What are we looking at though, since we already have an 8% inflation rate? Do um, you think we might have some trouble in some of those contingency funds uh, because of that? So it definitely could get very tight. What, what we have done in some cases is when a department or an office has vacancy in their in their budget towards a new position when they ask them to put a filling position for a time period, if we get really tight. We haven't had to do that for many years, but sometimes we'll say, you know what, we know you have this position that's vacant, leave it vacant for a month longer to help us get where we need to on this. Reality right now is we're having a hard time filling a position anyway, so that's right. happening uh, organically as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Um, uh, Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, ma'am. Um, going back to a couple of things, uh, the Mason Valley uh, Mosquito Control District, one replacement vehicle. I mean, I, if we need a new vehicle, we, we need it. How many days a week does that run? I would say five. That's actually under a different budget that we will get to. 
Um, those those districts, we're still going to go to the budgets. I realize I included a capital outlay, but we're going to go to the budgets for after we finish. The okay, so, yeah, so we'll get to that. But it was brought up earlier. Yeah, they he uses that on a daily basis, and they're going out and they're treating here and there, and they're going out and they're checking to see where they're right. um, where the hatches are and. Right. They're, they're all over. The I just wasn't sure if it was used once or twice a week, and it's a vehicle we could share with um, Ma uh, Mason ba or uh, any other areas to, to help with that. So you answer my question. Thank you. Uh -huh. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Page. So one thing I do want to bring up, uh, since Commissioner Jacobson has brought up contingency and what we can do better, um, one thing that... Um, Josh and I have a pretty good hold on um, what our departments are requesting and we make recommendations for approval. Um, you will never see, well, I won't say that. Very seldom do you ever see an item come up for contingency transfer um, that we have not said, yeah, we, we need to do this. Um, but if the board is concerned about contingency, the board also needs to remember that um, we have just spent the last year and a half, two years spending monopoly money from the federal government. Yeah. And we've kind of gotten used to that. Contingency is not that monopoly money. Um, so when you see a special project that comes up um, and the, the widget that we want for downtown um, stagecoach or whatever, um, if it's not budgeted for, um, we're gonna re we'll be requesting that the board um, go through staff to take a look at what you're requesting prior to it be, being on the agenda. And then we will tell the board that we're recommending denial um, based upon um, where we are with the budget. Now that doesn't happen often, but we've all gotten used to having a little extra cash around to address some of our pet projects. Um, that cash is quickly drying up. And uh, I'm, I'm fearful that maybe we've gotten um, used to having that around and, um, and it, it won't be here much longer. So just food for thought when you're looking at things and well, we can take this out of contingency. Um, keep in mind that if the sheriff has a significant issue um, where he's calling staff out for 12, 14, 16 hours, and he's got 15 guys in SWAT out, um, that's not budgeted for. So at the end of the year, when he's got, he's a million and a half over on his um, overtime budget because of significant events, that's where that funding comes from. So that's part of the reason why contingency is there to address those emergency situations as well um, on, on personnel costs, as well as operational costs. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, yes. Commissioner Jacobson here again. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, I agree, uh, Mr. Page. And when I was going through this budget, I, I can't help but think that there were many times when during meetings we would just, and when I say we, I'm gonna say me, approve things uh it just said well we can use contingency money all right let's do that let's go for it and and i don't um i don't think that uh that kind of rubber stamp is what what i want to continue doing it needs if something comes up that's necessary and it's necessary yeah but i felt i feel uh, just being honest um, I felt like many times this year I just rubber stamped uh, contingency money, and I don't think that that's taking care of the taxpayers' dollars to the best of their ability. So I am going to do a goal of mine this year is to be uh, a little more prudent for sure. Thank you. So a rule of thought to go by in a board meeting is if there's an item on the agenda that's going to be coming out of contingency and you don't see Mr. Foley sitting in the room, it's probably supported. If you see Mr. Foley walk in the room shaking his head, that poor department, that poor department head is going to lose five to zero. That has been <laughs> that has been the tradition now for at least the 12 years I've been in this position. Um, if he walks in standing behind you, you're telling this great story about how wonderful this widget's going to be, and he's standing behind me shaking his head, no, I might as well just go home. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in any other comments or questions, do we want to finalize this portion or just move on, Josh? Matt, Madam Chair, I do believe we have um, Mr. Russ here to give some public participation. Oh. I have you. 
comes up here today. You can have my seat. I can probably help that. <laughs> <laughs> on the table. I get to sit here by the candy dish. Uh, Russ Wright from Dayton. I have a question for Josh or for Mr. Foley and then a comment. Um, Mr. Foley, is your middle name Merlin? <laughs> <laughs> it is not, but I like that name. <laughs> uh, my comment is uh, the last budget session that I participated in was a four and a half day fist fight that resulted in one of our commissioners quitting at noon on Friday, resigned his position on the commission. I'm, I'm impressed with, and you gentlemen that are sitting here aren't part of it, the commissioners that are on Zoom have more of a part in having developed a management style and a professionalism to your department heads that you can finish a budget that's however many millions of dollars that it is in half a day, uh, you're to be complimented. Thank you. And there's nothing to sign in, so I'm just going to sign off on the budget. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you. <laughs> you. You know, I would like to make a quick comment on that. Um, obviously, you know, I get called the senior on the board all the time, but I can remember my first couple of years on the board and the deja vu that we were talking about earlier as we uh, headed into a recession. And um, we had those long drawn out, I don't remember Commissioner quitting though, but we did have those long drawn out all day meetings, served lunch, dinner um, in the chambers. And we had a lot of gumballs, um, thanks to Commissioner Roberts to uh, play with. So um, I do believe that uh, we've learned to work very well um, with staff and all the departments and a ton of that credit goes directly to uh, Mr. Page and Mr. Foley and uh, don't wanna leave people out, but department heads across the board um, that all work together to get us where we're at today. So the reason why we're having a, what looks like a shorter meeting is because what we don't see in the meeting is all the many hours that these gentlemen and ladies and these departments put in prior to getting to this day. So uh, Mr. Wright, thank you for recognizing um, the efforts that we've uh, had in Lyon County and, and what we've achieved by doing so. So with that being said, Mr. Foley, I think at this point, the best thing is for you to just go ahead and go through everything you wanted to do and then we'll button everything up at the end. Okay, sounds good. Uh, if you okay. would like to move on to the special districts, we'll take them over well, the third um, agenda. Yeah, just, just a question. Since yes, Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice. Since, since we have individual agenda items, for these other budgets, wouldn't it be better from a procedural standpoint to go ahead and do the county budget now and, and take each one as it, as it comes as, as a, its own agenda item instead of going through everything and then going back and doing them all? Okay, um, well, I didn't, okay, Mr. Foley, uh, just so I'm, I'm clear, I didn't believe we were reading in these other ones yet. You were just giving us the information or am I incorrect? So I haven't gone through the other ones yet, um, but I think we can take action on item number 5A and adopt the budget for the county and then move on to the Mason Valley Mosquito Abatement District and I can cover that budget and so on and so forth because I intentionally have skipped those budgets even though we passed through them in the budget pages uh, so that we could do it that way if the board so choose. Uh, otherwise, we're going to go through all of them and then come back to item five at the end and make a motion. Either way works for me, but it's whatever you prefer. Okay. Um, yeah, I just thought we were doing it the other way, but that's okay. We can we can break it apart. Uh, so we want to entertain a motion at this point for five A. And did you want to note the changes, Mr. Foley? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're going to remove the $66,478 from the recommended budget out of the commissioner's uh, budget that was set aside for the camera system. 
we're going to increase in that same budget $10,000 in travel. Those are the only two changes. If the board would like, I can, I can take the approximately $50,000 difference and put that into transfer to the capital improvements fund towards that Dayton government complex yeah. um, for that, because it is kind of a one-time funding. And then I would uh, also adjust the contingency accordingly. So it remains at, and the ending fund balance. So contingency remains at 3% of the budget expenditures of the general fund. Yeah. I, I, I'm all for, I like that. So the motion. So I was going to say, um, if, if everybody's good with that, I would entertain a motion to that effect. I didn't catch every word, but um, I will make a motion that we approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-23, um, subtracting the $66,478 for the um, chamber camera system, putting $10,000 towards uh, travel for possible upcoming NACO events and other Board of Commissioner travel and putting the rest of the 56,478 towards the Dayton government complex um, as the changes to the tentative budget. I'll second that. Madam Chair. If uh, I, yes, Mr. Foley. Just because it makes the quarterly entries easier on the, the uh, transfer, can we make that just an even 50,000 and the remainder goes in fund balance that gets transferred? Absolutely. Okay, that would be my recommendation. Okay, Dr. second Reed still stand. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Any public comment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so next on our agenda is to recess to reconvene as the Mason Valley Mosquito Abatement District Board. First up is public participation. This is for any public participation, just a reminder of something that's not on the agenda. So do I have any public participate participation, I can't talk today, at this time? Seeing none, for possible action, approved tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Mr. Foley. So if you want to turn to the tab for the Mason Valley Mosquito Control District, it's on page 336 of your binder. Uh, this does have a dedicated tax rate of 8.38 cents. As we discussed previously, they're requesting a replacement vehicle uh, truck for, for their operation. And it does show that we're requesting to spend more money than we're bringing in in the fiscal year. And we budget that way every year because some years we have dry years and some years we have wet years. And in the wet years, we wanna make sure we have enough that we can spend some of the fund balance uh, to treat those. So we are hopeful that next spring will be a very wet year and we can spend some of that money on mosquito bait. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Mr. Foley? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Um, actually, Madam Chair. Yes. The vehicle uh, that we're purchasing, Jenkins. that vehicle that we're purchasing is was 50,000, right? So I haven't been bit by a mosquito very often in December. Do, does that vehicle get used outside of mosquito larvae season or is this, uh, does it sit? I guess I'm wondering just how much use. So the vehicle, so you have one full-time employee in the Mason Valley Mosquito Department. And he actually contracts with the Walker Weed Control District, which you'll get to as well, to provide those services for weed control for the, the um, south part of the county as well, certain areas. Yeah, I remember combining that, right? Mm -hmm. So he does all of that. That is his vehicle. That's his primary vehicle for everything that he does. And so it gets used significantly. Keep in mind, these are completely separate entities. They have nothing to do with anything else in the county. You just happen to be their board. Right. And so this is a hit for him to be able to do his job because his truck is about to stop working and he needs to have a truck. I was just curious. Okay, again, um, 
If we're good, can I get a motion, please? Uh, Madam, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, I move that we approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 for the Mason Valley Mosquito Abatement District Board. Second. second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Any public comment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, number eight, public participation. Anybody for public participation? Seeing none, we're going to adjourn to reconvene as the Central Lyon County Vector Control District Board. Again, public participation. Seeing none for possible action, approved tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023, Mr. Foley. Okay, so if you wanna to turn to that tab in your binder, it is on page 343, so the next tab. Uh, this fund covers Central Lyon County and it's four and a half cents the tax rate, which is vector control. So it does more than just mosquitoes. It does black flies and all of those other things that they need to do under vector control. They have no employees. You have a fantastic advisory board that goes out and spends hours and hours checking to see what needs to be done and working with a, a contractor that we contract to do the, the treatment of that area. So this is a budget. Again, this is one of those like the mosquito. We're budgeting to spend a lot more than uh, we have in revenues for the upcoming year. So we spend out of fund balance, hoping it will be a wet year next spring. <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Foley? Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve Central Lyon County uh, Vector Control District uh, budget as proposed. Second. Okay, hey, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Public comment? All in favor say aye. 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 In, uh, any opposed, sorry, lost my thought. Uh, number 11, par, uh, public participation. Seeing none, we're gonna adjourn to reconvene as the Walker River We Control District Board. Again, public participation for anything not on the agenda. Seeing none, number 13 for possible action, approved tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Mr. Foley. Josh Foley, uh, Vicker. This is the next tab in the binder, which is on page 347. And they assess 8.47 cents on land values in their district to provide the weed uh, control in that area. Uh, the budget's very similar from year to year. They have a seasonal employee that comes on and takes care of that. I, if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions for Mr. Foley? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion of uh, approving the tentative budget for the Walker River Weed Control District Board for fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Public comment? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. 14, public participation. Again, seeing none, we're gonna to adjourn to reconvene as the Silver Springs General Improvement District Board. 15, public participation. Seeing none, 16 for possible action, approved tentative budget for fiscal year 2022, 2023. Mr. Foley. Josh Foley, Lane County Council for the record. This is the second tab from the end of your binder, and it's on page 403. And you can see that our expenses have gone up significantly from the current year to next year. In fact, they exceed the requested expenses, re exceed our revenues by 183,000. Keep in mind, this district has no debt whatsoever, so we're not making any principal payments. Um, we're going to have to watch it closely, but we usually request more than we're actually spending um, for budget so that we don't get in the situation where we can't buy supplies that we have to buy. And so we've requested a little more than we would probably actually spend, hopefully, uh, but we'll just have to keep our eye on this district as we go forward. Okay, any questions for Mr. Foley? Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve um, the tentative budget for the Silver Springs General Improvement District Board as written for the year 2022-23, I guess I should have. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Public comment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
A motion carries. 17, public participation. Again, seeing none, we're going to adjourn to reconvene as the Willow Creek General Improvement District Board. 18, public participation. Seeing none. Number 19, for, but for possible action, approve tentative budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Mr. Foley. Josh Foley, Lane County Council, for the record. Uh, this is the very final tab in your binder. It's on page 408. We have the Willow Creek General Improvement District. Uh, it does have a tax rate of 1.56 cents. We do levy $354 of user fees on the tax bill each year to help pay for repay some of the debt that's been borrowed on this through USDA on the sewer side. And again, there's no contingency. So we're requesting expenses to be slightly more than our revenues. And we usually come out close to a break even in this one. So that's all I have for this one. Okay, any questions for Mr. Foley? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the Willow Creek General Improvement District tentative budget for 2022-2023 as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Public comment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Number 20, public participation. Again, seeing none, we're gonna to adjourn to reconvene as the Lyon County Board of Commissioners. Number 21, Commissioner Comments. Uh, Commissioner Hockaday. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Foley and all the other heads of our department for all the work they've done in presenting a budget that actually balances, I hope. Thank you. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I also want to thank Mr. Foley and all the uh, department heads for their hard work in this. And Mr. Foley, personally, for putting up with me on the phone the last couple of days, answering some questions that I had. So uh, th thank you very much. And uh, once again, Lyon County is blessed with an outstanding staff. And we should be thankful for that. Commissioner Jacobson. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Keller. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I want to thank Josh and the staff department heads. Um, getting a vote of confidence from me to you doesn't maybe mean anything to you, but but uh, you sure mean a lot to me. And uh, you're very um, your conservative nature is appreciated. Um, and and uh, I think that you do an excellent job. Your staff does an outstanding job. And and uh, thank you very much. We you are appreciated. Well, that's right. We don't have kin, so that leaves me. Um, I think I kind of made my comments earlier, um, you know, what it was like in the old days to, to now. Um, so again, you know, thank you, Mr. Foley, uh, Mr. Page, Aaron for putting up for, with them, um, and the rest of the staff and departments for all the, the great work that they do. Um, I don't think we would be here today in these, this budget the way it's presented now um, without all the hard work. So again, thank you for, for everything you've done. I'm gonna go to public participation. Well, actually I'm gonna back up, even though it's commissioner comments, um, it's not on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Page, Mr. Foley, did you have any comments? Madam Chair, the only thing I, I would like to say is that um, we have come a long way from when I first took over this position. Um, this used to be a two-day process. Uh, we had it done before noon today. Um, that's large in part to uh, the Board of Commissioners um, allowing us to do our job and trusting the work that we've done and communicating back and forth over um, the weeks in, in preparation of the budget. So um, the Board has done a good job of, of um, thanking staff. Uh, the Board also needs to recognize themselves for uh, being effective communicators and dealing with staff and getting their questions answered um, and, and addressing issues that they want to see in a budget, which to be quite honest with you, this is the first year in 12 years that we've actually had board members say, we want to see this in a budget, or we want to see that in a budget. So I appreciate those comments. Um, I am very grateful for the staff we have. I'm very grateful for Mr. Foley. Uh, we would not be in the position we're in financially if we had some of the um, other fiscal folks that are out there in some of the other counties. Um, I think we'd be in trouble. So I thank you. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. 
Okay, again, Mr. Foley, did you have anything to add before we I, move on here? Uh, thank you, Josh Ford, Ryan County Comptroller. I, I just want to let everyone know it's a pleasure working with this board. I appreciate the support and, and the questions and the conversations that we're able to have. Um, just fantastic people to work with. And I can never say enough about Mr. Page, best county manager I've worked with, and I've worked with a number. Um, he's fantastic to work with. And our department heads, we have the best department heads in the state. I have no question about that. And they make this process run smoothly. They're responsible. They take care of the public's funds in a really, really professional manner and well done. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Fiscally justifiable. I'm sorry, what was that? Not that I was. I should have said anything. Oh. <laughs> justifiable manner. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to end that with, um, you know, I've kind of said it before is the fact that, uh, you know, it's not just our county manager and our comptroller, but literally all the department heads and everyone that works for Lyon County, whether you're in that building where you're sitting now or in Dayton, you know, dealing with a, a road department guy or whatever, um, Lyon County people make us shine and, uh, so it's appreciated. I want to go on to our last public participation. So Mr. Russ Wright, this is your last chance to make a comment. And he's still from Dayton. And he's still from Dayton. <laughs> and in the front row. Okay, well, I didn't see him get up. So, and I didn't see anybody with their hands up on Zoom. So with that being said, everybody have an awesome day and we are adjourned. See you tomorrow. Yeah.